You've seen that glacial and interglacial periods have alternated for tens of thousands of years in geological history, a completely normal occurrence. You've also learned that these variations are related to the Earth's orbit around the Sun. And you've seen that the CO2 concentration has also repeatedly changed during these glacial and interglacial periods. If you consider these three parameters, you'll realize that the Earth's orbital elements, CO2 concentration, and temperature increase are somehow connected. But how? Well, let's dive into the world of modeling with Dr. Uta Merke, a geosystem modeling research assistant at the University of Bremen, and take a look at the past 800,000 years. She explains how to use data from the past to better understand our climate system. Scenarios can then be developed and padded out for the future. In fact, we'll find out that today we have the highest CO2 concentration in the atmosphere in the last 800,000 years, a significant statement. We can reconstruct the climate of the distant past from ice cores and marine sediments. They tell us the story of the development of the climate system, so to speak. The succession of interglacial and glacial periods in the past 800,000 years is particularly prominent in paleo records. These fluctuations in the climate system are typically associated with variations in the orbital elements of the Earth, which are essentially explained by the Milankovitch theory. In addition to the variations in the orbital elements, greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere can also contribute significantly to the dynamics of the climate system and to the variations on various timescales. If we now would like to better understand what marine sediments and ice cores are telling us, we need to study the dynamics of the climate system in more detail, and for this purpose a numerical climate model is a very helpful tool. The beauty of such a climate model is that it can also include a component to simulate the extent and volume of ice sheets on continents, and this gives us the opportunity to compare the results of these simulations directly with the results obtained from ice cores or marine sediments. In addition, the model also gives us the opportunity to investigate individual factors more closely by turning specific influencing factors on and off in the model in order to examine their relative influence on climate in more detail. Why is this important? In addition to the variations in the Earth's orbit, variations in greenhouse gas concentrations, for instance, can also result in fluctuations in the climate system. Therefore, the major issues are, what is the relative influence of specific factors? Which factors are dominant and during which period in climate history? And we can also ask, which factors actually contribute to the story that the ice cores and marine sediments are telling us? Here we consider model results where such an effort has been undertaken. What happens when you turn individual factors on and off in the model? In a first experiment, the solar radiation was allowed to vary to take into account the variations in the Earth's orbit, while the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere was set to a fixed value of 280 ppm. As you can see in this graphic, the model simulates the evolution in time of the ice volume in the Northern Hemisphere. The fluctuations of the ice volume between glacial and interglacial periods are significantly lower than those which are typically obtained from reconstructions. These reconstructions indicate changes which correspond to sea level changes of more than 100 meter. The simulated fluctuations are irregular and clearly too small in amplitude. In a second experiment, the radiation is allowed to vary as in the first experiment, but now the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is set to a significantly lower value of 200 ppm. As illustrated by the blue line, the model shows that reducing the CO2 level to 200 ppm results in fluctuations in the ice volume with a larger amplitude between interglacial and glacial periods. The previous model experiment only simulated ice volume fluctuations corresponding to sea level fluctuations of less than 40 meters. In contrast, values of about 70 meter sea level change are now simulated with a reduced CO2 concentration. In a third experiment, both the radiation fluctuations resulting from variations in the Earth's orbital elements and fluctuations in carbon dioxide concentration are now specified in the model. And if both factors in the model are allowed to vary over time, as we see by the blue shading, the ice volume in the northern hemisphere now responds significantly differently to the forcings. In particular, the amplitudes are much more pronounced now and there are clear transitions from interglacial to glacial periods and from glacial to interglacial periods. 
We also see that these two transitions occur at different rates. The transition from glacial to interglacial periods is faster than that from interglacial to glacial periods. In summary, the peaks, that is the maximum ice volume reached during the ice ages, are now significantly closer to the values reported by the reconstructions. So we can conclude that we have to specify both the fluctuations in the Earth's orbital elements and the fluctuations in the carbon dioxide concentration in the model in order to obtain realistic results for the fluctuations in ice volume. In other words, fluctuations in Earth's orbital elements make a major contribution to the succession of interglacial and glacial periods. But you also need the fluctuations in the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to be able to accurately reproduce the findings from reconstructions and the exact dynamics of the interglacial-glacial cycles in the model.